We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear, quizzes, podcasts, video casts, author events, and we will not slacken in any way in our efforts to bring this stuff to you as Christmas approaches. And what we strongly suggest is you avail yourself uh, of a present for the person in your life that you love the most, i.e. you, and get yourself a Word Patreon subscription. And if you need further encouragement this year, there will be a Word in Your Attic annual, which will only be available exclusively to Patreon supporters. So have a look at the details at the link below. Word in Your Attic, a Zoom with a view. Hey, well, welcome to another Word in Your Attic. We're delighted to be joined by old friend of the podcast, Sir Tim Rice. Tim, how are you doing? Terrific. I'm, I'm hanging in there. Thanks. <laughs> Good. And yeah, can we, can we, where do we find you? Uh, you're at home at the I'm moment? At home, yeah, I'm at home uh, in a village called Hambledon near Marlow. Uh, in, I, I'm not sure what county I'm in because the postal address is, is Oxfordshire. The, um, I'm actually technically geographically in Buckinghamshire and the postcode is Berkshire. Oh, right. Uh, okay. I don't know. There are I... two Hamiltons, is that right? One, one of which was the one that invented cricket. But yeah, you're but not I... in that one, which no, seems not. wrong. It's so. annoying. It, it's <laughs> yeah. very confusing because yeah. I'm, I'm better known for liking cricket than anything else, but certainly better known than that for songwriting. And, and people say, oh, you must be thrilled being in Hamilton. I'm in the wrong Hamilton. <laughs> yes. A uh, fake Hamilton. Yeah. yeah. Listen, Tim, let's start with this because today we're recording this on December the 8th um 2020 yeah which is of course 40 years to the day or pretty much to the hour a very the, sad day yeah. the, the news of john lennon's death uh, well, I came a, through. um i had a, i have a story about that um i was uh, expecting a call from robert stigwood um on the night of december the 7th from new york robert stigwood the theatrical impresario and record producer and everything bg's manager and all that yeah. And um, I had two phones, um, two phone lines in those days in my house in Oxfordshire, funnily enough. And one was only an office line and one was a home line, both landlines. And I normally turned the office line off because I didn't want to be dis you know, disturbed by people at three in the morning from America or Australia. But on this occasion, because it was Robert Stigwood, he said he was going to call. I left the phone, that, the office line, put it into my bedroom. Um, which was just a matter of turning a switch, really. Um, and I thought Robert would ring about midnight or one, but he didn't ring. Um, not surprising with Robert, who I loved. But at, at five in the morning, the phone went, and, and it, was, it was the office line. And I thought, oh, God, bloody Robert Stigwood. He's rung me at 5 a.m. midnight in New York. And I picked up the phone, and it was Radio Oxford saying, mm -hmm. Have you heard, or no, telling me that John Lennon had been murdered and do I have any thoughts about it? And I was absolutely gobsmacked. And, you know, I said, uh, uh, what's, you know, I'll, I'll call you back. And I did. I called them back in about half an hour and said something probably reasonably um, coherent at, at, at half past five in the morning. But the irony was that Robert lived in the block of flats right next door to where oh, Lennon was murdered. And so instead of getting my call from Central Park West, Robert's flat or apartment, I got it about a terrible tragedy yeah. one block away. It was weird. Right, right. right. But um, obviously that's not important, but it, was, it, was, it made me think a bit. I thought that was rather strange. It is. It's one Very of those days that you just, you just remember. I mean, oh, I, I, I was only thinking today about the flat we were living in at the time. I hadn't thought about the flat in years. And it was only the <laughs> remembering. We are only in that flat one year. But the one thing I remember is j that's, when, uh, that's when we heard the news that John Lennon died. And, yeah. of course, Mark and I were both on smash hits. Were we? we were on smash hits. We were. I mean, I think, I think the news came through. Uh, I was living with a girl who, who was now my wife and, and, and a guy, a, a writer called Tom Hibbert. And I remember him waking me up at about four, half past four in the morning because it had just come through on the radio in England at that time to say this has happened. We just couldn't believe it and just stayed yeah. up and then started ringing people actually at about six or seven o'clock, you know. And I remember seeing you, Dave, I remember coming into work, being in the Smash Hits office and all sitting around just being absolutely just dumbstruck. Yeah. yeah. Not knowing how to react. As was remember... McCartney, that terrible thing where um, somebody sort of doorstepped him and he said something like, it's a drag or something. And everyone yeah. kind of mis yeah. misinterpreted that he simply yeah. couldn't articulate what he felt, you know. Did no, you ever I, meet, I, did you I, ever I meet had, him? Sorry. Did you ever meet him? 
Not really. I'm, I met him very briefly, but um, in EMI Studios when um, I went into the wrong studio when I was a management trainee at EMI and just... Oh, of course. First records. Yes. I, I was doing a record with Norrie Paramore, my boss, and The Scaffold. And I went into Studio 2 because I think that was where we were told we were doing, but I didn't realise that, in fact, we'd moved to Studio 3 and the Beatles, wow, were in Studio 2. And I wandered in and um, uh, all, all I saw was the engineer. And I said, um, uh, is this the right studio? Is, is Martin here? I didn't mean George Martin, but it must have sounded as if I did. I met <laughs> Martin, um, who's also working with Norrie Paramore. And a voice from the sofa hidden behind the control panel, and he said something in Spanish, really, you know, you know, total gob gobbledygook, blah, 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 you know, and it was John Lennon sitting there with Yoko. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm in the wrong studio. <laughs> and I sort of rushed out, um, feeling terribly embarrassed. Um, but I, that was as close as I got. I did meet the other Beatles um, over the years, um, but tragically, I never, never really met John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was scaffold the record had some what was the scaffold record you were yeah, working well, on i want to know there were well, some it, quite interesting people on backing vocals were there Am I yes uh, well it, jack bruce and elton john or was um it? no i think that's got a bit exaggerated all right <laughs> um actually jack bruce might have been on it because it was really the pink and oh, um, right yeah, and uh it was my first number one because i was singing on it <laughs> oh there you oh, go great uh, and um with 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 my friend martin who also worked at emi we we, we have a chorus um, backing up Graham Nash, who sang the verse about Jennifer Eccles. Yes, yes. Jennifer Eccles, you know, and all that. Um, and, and the boys all called her names. That was Graham. And then Martin and I went, na, 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 na. And that was it. But we're on the record. So if well, you listen, you next, time you, next time you hear Lily the Pink, listen up for Graham Nash's verse. And then Terrific. You'll hear me and my friend Martin doing our bit. So I, it was a number one record, wasn't it? Number one. Huge Unfortunately, record. I was not on a royalty. <laughs> <laughs> no. How many number ones did the Scaffold have? Was that the only oh, number? Oh, that was the only one. They had, they, they had a few hits. They were a very talented trio. Roger McGough, a brilliant poet. John Gorman, a very funny, lugubrious comedian. Um, and Mike McGear, Paul's brother. And he was a good musician. I mean, they were all very entertaining and, and very original. They had, um, Lily the Pink was the biggest, and they had um, Thank You Very Much. And, I'd call it for the um, Entry Iron. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, right. that was a good one. And um, today's Monday. We did an album with them, which which did okay. And we did a live album, which did well. Uh, that, when I say we, I mean Nori Paramore with me helping out making the coffee. Right. But um, I learned a lot from The Scaffold. And I'm still um, still sort of in touch with them. Um, every so often I run into Roger McGough. Um, and, I, and I spoke to Mike quite recently. I, I don't know what's happened to John. I think he went to live in France. Was John Goldman, did he end up a producer of Tiz Was? He was on Tiz Was. Um, and uh, the last contact I had with him was, was really strange. I mean, this is strange story time. Because um, I, in, I used to live in Great Milton in Oxfordshire and gave away a load of paperback books to the Great Milton fate in 1976. Um, Agatha Christie stuff and things I'd read. And um, about 20 years later, I received a package from... France from John Gorman, who I hadn't heard of at that point for several years, including including a book, and it was a paperback which clearly had belonged to me, and it said in its side, you know, Tim Rice purchased somewhere in 1976, Oxford or something, and he said we found this book in a back room in a newsagent's shop in Thailand, and <laughs> wondered if it was anything to do with you, and it was my paperback which after 20 years had got out to somehow got out to Thailand. Amazing. <laughs> and somebody I knew went in and bought it. <laughs> Weird. And thought you might, you might like to be reunited with it. Which yeah, is yes, that's what he said, actually. I've kept the letter, and this time around, I haven't given away the paperback. Um, it's in one of my shelves here somewhere, and in it is John's letter. And I thought, <laughs> well, in, in 100 years' time, people will find this and think, what a very interesting historical document. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Do you, are, you, are you a hoarder, Tim? Do you keep things? Well, I am a bit of a hoarder, but only for books and records. Um, I've got far too many of both, and... I am trying to have a bit of a clear out, mainly of books, but of course they might end up and coming back to me via a news yeah, absolutely. Bangkok. So, um, <laughs> uh, Can you remember the first singles that you bought? You know, when yes, you were absolutely the, the the first single I bought was a seventy-eight of Tommy Steele singing the blues. Oh, that's uh, a great record. Which I actually preferred even now, 
uh, to the Guy Mitchell version. I mean, it was a complete copy in the arrangement, but Tommy had a much better rock and roll voice than Guy. I mean, the moon Guy, and stars no longer shine. Yes. I lost that love that once was mine. It's fantastic. He, the dream was gone, I once. That, that, that once was mine. But oh. Tommy had a wonderful bit where he went, oh, you know. I don't quite know what that was, but that was how he got from the middle eight back to the verse. And Guy just went, yoo-hoo, or something. And, but Tommy had that um, rock and roll slur. He was a very, very good early rocker. And in fact, I've got here oh, go on. the first album I ever owned, which is a 10-inch. Oh, lovely. Tommy Steele story. Oh, oh that's really? what a great cover. It, it was a great cover. And I, I, the 78 tragically perished. It just got broken. I've got one or two other Tommy Steele 78s that have survived, including Shira Lee and um, uh, Come On, Let's Go. That was a good one. I, I've still got them somewhere. But... This, this album, which had 14 tracks and only 10 inches, including great songs like Handful of Songs and Water, Water um, and Teenage Party. And I'm, I remain a great fan of Tommy's and I've become quite a very good friend of his. And I was delighted when he, when he, when he picked up his knighthood. And I went to see him in Plymouth about four years ago. And I went backstage and, and we were sitting in the dressing room and a fan came in, you know, of a certain age, lovely lady, came in with a single of um, Knee Deep in the Blues, which was the follow-up to uh, Sing in the Blues. And on the flip was a song called Teenage Party, which is on this album. And Tommy was signing this record. And, and, uh, and I said, what's on the flip of that? Because I'd forgotten, because I didn't have the single, I had the album. And he said, Teenage Party. I said, oh, I remember that one. I went, gonna have a teenage party, gonna have a teenage time, gonna live it high and hearty if you're ready. And Tommy joined in. and. We sang a verse together of this incredibly obscure album track and B-side. And at the end of it, he said, I think we're the only two people in England who know that song. <laughs> <laughs> and we sang a duet. They, we should have recorded it. Should absolutely. Have been yeah, absolutely. The, the lady must have been delighted, surely. I, well, yes, I think she was a bit sort of bewildered. She didn't quite know who I was, I don't think. I mean, I must have been introduced, but um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was great fun. And it was, you know, and I, I, I'm still in touch. And uh, we're meant to be having lunch to celebrate his knighthood, but um, it's been put off about three times. Well, obviously, yes, but, yes. Um, it, it will happen. So Tommy Steele's story, I remember going to see that at the Osset Palladium when Osset, the tiny place I lived in, had a cinema. Right. Those days. So that film has to have come out very, very hard on the heels of his pop success. I know. Again, they, they made a film really quickly, didn't they? I mean, it was a biopic within about six months of <laughs> him being famous. And actually, it wasn't bad. Um, I saw it quite recently on, on Talking Pictures. There you and, go. And, and some of the songs are, are really, I mean, Lana Bart was involved with a lot of them, which is why yeah, they, were, they were good. Was. Butter, Butterfingers is a great song. And Tommy sang them really well. And um, it, you know, told, roughly speaking, the story of his life to a certain extent. But... There wasn't much to tell, really, but but it was still a good film. Then he did the Duke War Jeans, which was um, I've also got the album of that somewhere, but I haven't bought it right here. Um, <laughs> on the <desk>. the um, Duke War Jeans is again has turned up on Talking Pictures TV yeah. only recently. <laughs> yes, that I didn't think that quite worked. There were a couple of good songs in it, but the story was a bit, you know, and okay. Tommy playing two people. But um, then then Tommy the Toreador, which I enjoyed. Of course, <laughs> the little white ball. I forgot. Yeah. The I'm not sure you could play Little White Bull now, but um, it was. Oh, uh, but my, <laughs> I loved it when I was about 15 or 16, and um, my kids uh, loved it when they were five and six. Little White Bull was one of their favourite songs. It's, it's a lovely song. It's, again, it's Lionel Bart, you know. Um, Is and, it? And um, he he was such a great songwriter, and um, I did know Lionel a bit, but I regret not making more of a fuss of him while he was alive. And no, sure. frankly, I was rather miffed when um, there was a new theatre named in London recently and called the Sondheim. Uh. Well, Sondheim is great, no disputing that, but he's not British, he's still alive, and he's got a theatre named after him already. And there's no theatre named after, or at least no West End theatre named after Lionel Bart. And if I owned a West End theatre and I wanted to rename it, and I'm actually in principle against renaming, I think it loses all tradition and continuity, but if I was going to rename the Queen's, which is the theatre that is now the Sondheim, I would have called it the Lionel Bart. Lionel Bart. Nothing absolutely. against Sondheim at all. It's just no. that, you know, he's 
he's not even British. He's hardly over here. Yeah. And and really, theatres should only really be named after people who have passed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So was Tommy Steele the first person you were a kind of big fan of? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, then it was um, Elvis, of course, and, and Buddy Holly. You see, as you well know, Buddy Holly and the crickets were bigger here proportionately than they were in America. I'm trying I mean, to work out how old you would have been at the time, about 11 would you have been when, um, when Elvis born, happened? I was born in 44 and Elvis yes. happened in 56, yes. Yeah. But I somehow missed Heartbreak Hotel. Every time I open a biog of a rocker of my age, it's always, then I woke up and I heard Heartbreak Hotel and my life changed. Yeah. Yes. I, <laughs> I was obviously a bit slow because the first Elvis record I was aware of was All Shook Up, which I thought was fantastic. And then I discovered um, back Elvis stuff and everything. And um, I think I've got an Elvis. I've got an oh, Elvis go on, show there. us. What have you got there? Oh, no, no, Elvis Golden. Um, no, oh, I, I, this, oh, here we are, yeah. This is, this is the first, this is a really obscure um, oh, Elvis album. Oh, wow. Again, ten, yeah. the best of Elvis. And that's and 10 inches, it? 10 inch, yeah. And it's, it, it came out, that the, the one that everybody's got and I've got as well is, is Elvis Golden Volume 1 which has 14 tracks, different track layout from America in Britain. But in, in Britain, they stuck on tracks we didn't know, like I forgot to remember to forget. And I love yeah. it. But this one, putting on glasses, <laughs> <laughs> just, just for show, because, you know, just because we're yes. doing Buddy Holly. Yeah, right? yeah, playing glass in them. Yeah. I mean, this is great. Heartbreak, it's only got 10 tracks. Heartbreak Hotel. I don't care if the sun and it says Heartbreak Hotel brackets with rhythm accompaniment. Oh, very good. <laughs> That's an understatement. Don't frighten but, the horses. Yeah. yeah. I don't care if the sun don't shine. Blue Moon, Tutti Frutti, All Shook Up, Hound Dog, Too Much. I always love Too Much. Um, any, I love them all. Anyway, You Want Me, Don't Be Cruel and Playing for Keeps. I mean, what an album. That's a fantastic record. And um, the, the um, 14 track Golden Volume 1 has most of those on it and, 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 and a few more. But once I heard All Shook Up and saw a clip of um, Teddy Bear on Six Five Special, and I got the 78s of Teddy Bear and Let's Have a Party um, for my 14th birthday, I think it would have been, or, or 13th, any 13th, I think. And I was into Elvis in a big, big way. I mean, he was just phenomenal. And, so um, the, the music playing device in your house when you're a small child must have been a 78 player. What was that? Well, originally, yeah, my... my Auntie Gertie, who was born in the 19th century, had a wind-up um, record player. And, and that was the one on which we blasted out Singing the Blues and Rebel Rock on the flip. And I bought Diana by Paul Anker when, again, when I was just 13. Um, I only bought like one record every six weeks. That was all one could afford. Or okay. Birthdays and Christmas were very important. But um, the 78s, you know, one or two perished, sad to say. Um, and of course, as you know, they they... They, they don't play forever. Um, well, actually, that's not true, because here I have Jailhouse Rock by Elvis Presley. Oh, and and I've, got, um, I've, I've got um 378s, which um, I still play, and I've rigged up a special 78-player um, hi-fi, as it were, a decent needle going through oh, proper really? speakers. And, and if the 78's in good nick, the sound is pretty good. Oh, really? um, they wear out, don't they? You can only play them well, a certain number of times. Well, on, on Auntie Gertie's gramophone, yes. You can only because they had a great big lump of metal, that's right. <laughs> but, uh, but, Shellac yeah. peeling off the needle. <laughs> but on the gadget I've got now, which is a very light stylus, just yep. like, enough to play it, it, it sounds wonderful. And I, I play, I, I've got some really sort of strange ones, you know, but um, I, I bought about 2,000 78s in yeah. 1950, no, what am I talking about, 1973, um, at an auction because there were 2,078s and about 1,500 or more were classical. And um, the classical 78s don't have much value because you, I mean, you can't really play a symphony. You've got to play it in two-minute chunks and everything. Um, and I didn't really want them. I hadn't got room for them. So I um, gave them away to a, literally a um, junk man like Steptoe. He used to come around the streets of London. And, and I said, look, I've got all these 78s. He said, fantastic. But I kept anything that was pop including the ones from the 30s and the 40s, like Bing Crosby and the Andrews Sisters and early Frank Sinatra and all that. And I also kept, before I'd given them away to the junk man, I had a letter, this is way before the days, of, almost before the days of telephone, but certainly before the days of email. I had a letter from a bloke who'd 
who'd heard me being interviewed on Radio One Newsbeat um, about my purchase. And in it, I'd said, well, I bought all these classical records that I don't really want, and I'm sure I can find a home for them. And um, he said, oh, what, what records? I said, well, there's, there's a whole lot by a lady called Dame Clara Butt. Oh, have you heard of Dame Clara Butt? Yeah, I have. Yeah, go well, on. she's very famous. But at that point, I hadn't. I was an ignorant fool. And she was a great opera diva. She was the Montserrat Caballi of her day or the, you know, um, Kathleen Ferrier or all that. I mean, she was a great singer. And um, this bloke wrote to me before I gave them to the junk man. And he said, I'm very, I'm a very, I'm a great fan of Dame Clara Butt. And I'll be very interested in, in purchasing your records if you don't want them. And I thought, Okay, great. So I, I didn't give those. So about 15 of them. I didn't give them to the junk man. And I wrote back to him saying, yes, well, give, give me a buzz. Here's my address. And, you know, come around and you can have a look at them. And I thought I might get 30 quid for this lot. Never heard back from him. Never. Not a, not a whisper. He may be watching this, in which case you've missed your chance, mate. <laughs> but, um, uh, I kept the records. And a few, and, and played them, and they were interesting. There was one of her singing at the George V's coronation, which was particularly interesting. Oh, very good. Um, and then a few months later, I was, I was at um, a Sotheby's auction. Sounds like I spent all my time hanging around at Sotheby's, which is <laughs> not quite true. And there was a portrait of Dame Clara Butt came up, an oil painting, for about, I think it was about 200 quid. And I thought, well, I'm a fan of Dame Clara, but I've got virtually her entire 78 collection. <laughs> so I bought the painting and it still hangs on my wall today. It's actually down in, in Cornwall. Um, but it's a, it's a nice picture. And um, quite a few people say, oh, is that Dame Clara? But, and indeed it is. Right. Um, and uh, it, it, it goes rather well with the records, which I do occasionally play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're the foremost Clara Butt collector. I think I, I probably am. <laughs> yes, probably the leading Clara Butt record owner. There may be some butts around. Yes, composition, competition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen that wonderful film? I think about you with your hi fi uh, 78 setup. Have you seen that wonderful film? Is it called Desperate Man Blues or Worried Man Blues? About the American 78 collector Joe Bussard. No. You've got to see I that. You're right. What, what's it, his name? It, it, Joe Bussard, B U S S A R D. As he was the man who originally discovered and recorded John Fay and Leo Kotke and people like that. Oh, but right. he is he is one of those people who believe that all good music was done between, I don't know, 1926, 1930. And then that's your lot kind of thing, you know. And so it's all blues and jazz. But he, he lives in, I think, Maryland. And he just has this fabulous record hut. Well, well I've, made a, I've made a note of him, and, and, and that, that sounds fantastic. I, I, I mean, that's right up my alley. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm sure you'd love it. You'd love it. I mean, I've got quite a lot of 78s. So I've, 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 um, I've, I've got a, a sort of picture book, of the picture 78s from the um, oh, what? 1940s. Oh, wow. oh that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's a different I, place. I had no idea those things existed. Yeah. That's incredible. It looks like a plate. It's, like, it's a plate. It's yeah. on, on, on Vogue. Um, oh, the I French about, label. Yeah, I got about eight or nine of these. Oh, wow. um, but only one of them was a, was a minor chart country hit. A lot of them are country records. This is by Art Castle and his <laughs> orchestra, vocal by Gloria Hart and Art Castle, and it's called A Little Consideration. Oh, beautiful. That's fantastic. <laughs> and, and on the flip is Sweetheart. Surely, if they're so fragile, seventy-eight. When you play that, well, didn't didn't the picture just disintegrate? No, no, no. It's it's they're they're almost more like forty-fives in their feel. Um, there's 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 a plastic coating, very tough. Right. But they're, they're totally playable, and um, some of them are quite good. I mean, I, I I looked up all my chart books. I thought, well, Art Castle must have had a hit somewhere, but he didn't have. That wasn't one of them. And, Dave, uh, that's a first, isn't it? On word in your attic, the first seventy-eight picture. First picture disc. seventy-eight. We never that's had incredible. that before. That's yeah. <laughs> Well, it's terrific quite, um and it's 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 10 inches which i always thought was a perfect size if you're on the expression i mean it, it, it's it's <laughs> it's it's not it's not too i mean you can get a lot on it and it's not too unwieldy you know compared with the wonderful 45s which of course we love this is another tommy Steele. Let, let's come on let's go tommy Steele. and with, um, with the with the kind of triangle shaped yeah. um uh, dink yes. in the middle whatever we call those things I remember a friend of mine on the school bus, we were arguing about 78s and 45s, and I was saying, I think 45s are going to catch on. 
And he said, no, they won't because the bit in the middle comes out too easily. And he, <laughs> and so we spent the next 10 minutes trying to push it out. It was very oh, difficult. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, ever ha- have you ever had a jukebox? Yeah, I've got one. Yeah, I've got a jukebox here. And, and it's um, uh, permanently full, uh, you know, of, of, of pretty standard records, um, including... But it goes everything from Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter by Herman's Hermits, which I have a soft spot for, <laughs> and um, Elvis and, you know, um, Don McLean and Dylan. I mean, good, good pop singles. Talking of Dylan, sorry, I've got a, another bit of topical thing, yeah. a top, topical discussion. Bob Dylan sold his catalogue yesterday. Allegedly, according to New York Times, estimate $300 million. I'm sure nobody knows. Right. What do, you, what do you think about that kind of thing? Well, this is Bob's latest album. Which is, this right. Is the, um, I showed you the first vinyl album I bought, Tommy Steele's Story. This is the most recent one. That's the most recent it's, one. Um, yeah. Bob Dylan's uh, Rowdy Ways, or what else he called? Rough and Rowdy. Rough and Rowdy Ways, yeah. yeah. And it's pretty good. It's got one side completely, um, this, this um, not really a song, but this sort of speech or or ramble and rather interesting about President Kennedy. Um, and, uh, but aren't people selling their catalogues because they're just unsure of what the value of music is going to be like in, in you know, 10 years time? Or, I mean, yeah, why, why is there suddenly a great move to, to sell catalogues? I, I don't think it's so much they're unsure, but they don't care because, you know, they're like many of us, they're getting on. Um, and Bob Dylan is nearly 80. I suppose he doesn't need any money, but maybe he wants to give money to his descendants or what I don't know but um you can I mean I could probably sell my catalogue for nothing like Bob Dylan's but good good show tunes you know and shows that keep going like Superstar which is now 50 years old and um Evita and Lion King these things will probably I mean this I'm not trying to brag here but I'm just stating what I think is a fact is these things will probably still be played in 40, 50 years' time. I'm sure. Maybe, maybe not quite as much, but kids will be doing Joseph, you know. I hope my grandchildren, yeah. when they're my age, will, will their, their grandchildren might well be doing Joseph. So um, for a publisher, it makes sense if we take the long-term view. If you're building a, a company, I mean, if you're 80 yourself as a publisher, then you, why would you want to fork out $300 million for Bob Dylan stuff? But for a company, it makes sense. And... Um, Probably they they would they would get their investment back within ten or twelve years, um, maybe maybe quicker in his case. Yeah. But um, songwriters can do that. I mean, if 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 you're getting on and you've got you know a, a reasonable catalogue and you, you you know I mean obviously it's 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 something you ought to discuss with your descendants if you have any. Um, but it's it, it it makes a kind of sense really. It, it's yeah. it's a bit like selling a valuable painting or something. Yeah. Your credits, I because uh, yeah, lots of your credits pres- presumably shared with somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all of them virtually. Yes, yes. I've written a couple of songs on my own, but nobody cared. <laughs> <laughs> my mum quite liked one of them. <laughs> she, got, she got a free copy. So, Do you remember uh, the name of the first song you wrote? Actually, I think it was "Another Girl, Another Town." I'm trying to remember. Well, that. that's brilliant. In reading your your memoir. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, that's well well remembered. I wrote three songs almost at the same time, and I can't remember which one I actually wrote first, but um, I made a recorded, a, a, a reel-to-reel tape um, in my bedroom, and this is, I was 19, and um, I'd been in a pop group at school singing mainly Cliff Richard stuff and the Everly Brothers. Oh, the Aardvox. Yeah, the Aardvox, yes. Yes. Top, top of any alphabetical bill. Alphabetical Very list. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I quite enjoyed singing, and, and, and I'd never really thought about songwriting, but... Um, I'd, I'd learned four chords on the guitar and I and I um, strumming away and I was trying to, you know, write an interesting tune or at least a catchy tune. And people like Donovan were, were, were just coming onto the scene. This was early 65 and um, or late 64, early 65. And and Dylan had just I mean, I, I was I was aware of Dylan quite early on. And um, I thought I'll have a go at writing songs and I but mainly to sell my voice. I wanted to be a singer. And um, I, I, I wasn't totally awful. I was quite good at the school group. And I sent this tape around with my songs on it, not to sell the songs, but to sing songs that nobody else had sung. So I couldn't be compared yeah, unfavorably. Yeah, yeah. People couldn't say, well, Mick Jagger did that better or Tom Jones did that better. Nobody did those songs better than me because nobody else had heard them. <laughs> <laughs> and I sent this tape around to several record companies and I heard nothing until about 
two months later, I got a call from a music publisher, Mills Music. And um, chap said, oh, I mean, this has been forwarded to me by um, a uh, record company. And we, you know, it's a tape and, and, we, and we're trying to find the guy who wrote the songs. And I said, well, actually that was me, you know, because my name was obviously on the box. Um, and uh, said, oh, right, well, um, and I said, what do you think of the singer? And he said, no, no, he's terrible, but we write one of the songs. <laughs> So I said, oh, yeah, well, yeah, the singer wasn't very good. We got rid of it. <laughs> yeah, 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 he's, <laughs> he's, he's gone. But, but he's yeah, gone. I'm a songwriter. And one of the songs got recorded by a group called The Night Shift, who apparently, well, Jeff Beck was in The Night Shift for a while. Oh, wow. Um, but I, but and there's, I, there's some dispute as to whether he was actually on it or not. I did meet Jeff once, and he said he thought he might have been on it. But, and it was included on a Best of Jeff Beck compilation, weirdly. <laughs> um, even, but but it, 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 they were a sort of bluesy Yardbirds type outfit. And um, the record called That's My Story, which was one of those three songs, came out and didn't do anything, I'm afraid. It was on Piccadilly label, which was a proper label. But in those days, if you, if you had a 45, a, an actual 45 with your name on it, even in tiny print, that was almost like being on the bottom of the ladder. Because I mean, you were actually on the rung, the bottom yeah, rung. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, anybody can make a CD, anybody can make an album. And it may be good, but it may be terrible, but you can still make it. But in those days, nobody had a record pressing plant in their front room. This is know, the thing. So it, it. it was the physical object, wasn't it? Yeah. It was what yeah. made people feel that they'd achieved something, you know, to yeah, show yeah. to their mother, you know. Uh, no, I mean, it was really a, it was really a great calling card. I'm just <laughs> enjoyed by Lola. Hello, Lola. All right. Who's Lola? You come see yourself on the screen. Go on. This is we'll Lola. I'll Hello. We've we just seen the top of Lola. Oh, Oh yeah! Oh hello, Lola. Lola, how are you? I'm <laughs> fine. You're fine. Good. Lola's a friend of mine, and she's uh, in, she's three, and she speaks English and Hungarian. Oh my goodness! She's a very clever girl. That's very impressive. Good. You better your mum because mum's wondering where you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have to confess, I thought at first we we're going to see a pet. No. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a pet. I'm amazed she hasn't pestered, but um, <laughs> she's, she's a lovely little girl. She's um, but uh, nothing to do with me. I hasten to add. Right, right. <laughs> so your 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 records that you keep. Do you, do you play records regularly? Do you make a habit? Yes, of doing I, I, I play a lot. I'm I'm going through all my 78s at the moment, B sides and everything. I mean, this morning I played a cover of Johnny Mathis' "Chances Are," which was a big hit in America, but didn't do much over here. And it was covered by a chap on Columbia called Ronnie Harris. And I don't know much about Ronnie Harris, but I've got his version of Chances Are, which sounds very mathy, Mathis-esque. Yeah, right, right, right. And um, it's a nice recording, but it's a complete copy. It's one of the many, many covers of the day. Um, but I'm, I shall probably try and look up Ronnie Harris later on today and find a bit, bit about him. Right, I suspect right. he was not Norrie Paramore, but... Um, uh, some other Columbia a and man, because I think I would have known about him if he was Norrie Paramore. There's something wonderful about discovering that there are people still getting up in the morning and playing 78s first I know. thing. That really, I really <laughs> haven't <laughs> made my day. <laughs> it's a tragic tale. Well, if ever you're wandering by Hamilton, I, will, I, I can play you 78s all day long. <laughs> and so you still do the kind of looking up of people, because, I mean, you, you yeah. were, you know, one of your other claims to fame, of course, which people probably don't, pay so much attention to nowadays is the Guinness Book because it hit singles and all that stuff. Yes, that, that was something which I'd always wanted to do. In fact, that's really, it was, it was through that idea was how I met Andrew and got myself into the theatre business because um, I, I, I was, I'd had this record out, but I was, I was 19 and I was keen to do something and I was obsessed with pop records and the charts. And I thought there's no book which gives a history of the charts, which there wasn't. And I thought a book which just listed every top 10 would be very interesting and would sell. And I took it to a book publisher who agreed to meet me because he knew my mother, who was a freelance writer and written a few articles and, 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 and stories for magazines. And um, I went to meet this guy called Desmond Elliott and I went along armed, A, with the idea of, of this history of the charts, which if, if, if we think about it, it was only the charts had only been going for 13 years at that point. And I also had my, that's my story, single, to impress him, you see. And he, he, he showed me, and he was very nice. And he, and he said, well, um, I don't think this idea is very good. He said, 
I can't sell many books of what Mick Jagger had for breakfast. So I don't see how I'm going to sell a list of his records. And I said, but that's the whole point, you know, and, and he, but, he, but he didn't get it. And, but he said, what else do you do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a songwriter. And I gave him the record and he played it. He had a dance set or something in his office. And he played it and he said, well, I don't like that either. <laughs> <laughs> So have you got anything else? Yeah, I thought I thought this is this is a, not being this isn't my day. But then he said, however, you know, if you want to write songs, I know a young songwriter who's looking for someone to write with, um, and he's better at music than lyrics. And um, I think, if anything, your lyrics were slightly better than your tune. Um, so, and his name's Andrew Lloyd Webber. And I thought, well, okay, he'll have to change his name if he wants to make it. But never mind, I'll go and meet this guy. <laughs> and um, so I wrote Andrew a letter and gave him my office phone number because I was a law student. And um, Andrew rang up and I went around to meet him and that was it. And, and, he, and I met him and he said, oh, great to see you. And I write musicals. Are, are you keen on musicals? And I said, yes, thinking, I hope he doesn't ask me to name more than three. Um, <laughs> and he then sat down at his piano and said, I've written eight musicals, which he had, and he'd written them all at school. And he began playing these tunes. And I thought, these are really good. Um, and um, I knew a bit, actually, I'm slightly exaggerating there. I, I knew the scores of quite a few musicals, like My Fair Lady. My parents had the albums. And I'd never seen many of these shows, and I, I, I wasn't a theatre goer. But Andrew was obviously desperately keen to get into theatre, and he was good. So he said, would you like to write lyrics for this um, musical, which I've done at school, and it's now um, going to be performed in Oxford? Um, which it never was, in fact. Um, and I need a lyricist because the chap who wrote the words at school with me doesn't want to go on with it. He's going to be something insane like a doctor. Um, and, and, and so I, I... No future in that. Yeah, no future at all. <laughs> so funny enough, I, it, he was at Andrew's 70th birthday party, a lovely chap called Robin Barrow. And um, obviously very successful in his life and, and didn't regret writing or rather not writing lyrics. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, where, where was I? Oh, yes. So Andrew and I teamed up. And that was through my idea for a book, which was the list of the charts and an analysis, most number ones and all that. And it would have taken about 20 minutes to write in 1965. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I got distracted by, you know, the wonderful world of show business. And then I became friends with, with Paul Gambaccini. And we discovered that we both had up the, the prototype Joel Whitburn book, the very right. first one, which was a paperback just listing the billboard hits and it was, we, we couldn't put it down. It was, you know, and we thought there must be more, there must be more. Don't tell me what happened. <laughs> yes. and, and my brother, Joe was also equally obsessed. And we said, well, three of us got together um, and Mike Reed came on board as well. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we said, now who can we take this to? And some genius, probably me um, said Guinness, you know, that was the obvious one. And we rang up Guinness um, and because I had a, I, I was vaguely known then. I thought they might take my call. And um, I asked to speak to either Ross or Norris McWhorter. Oh, of course. And, and um, I was put through by chance to Norris, who was very friendly. And he said, this sounds like a good idea. I mean, he got it very quickly. He said, I think this could work. Why don't you come in sometime next week and, and talk to us about it? Fantastic. And then tragically, two days later, Ross McWhorter was murdered by was the American. murdered, yeah, yeah. And we thought, oh, I mean, it was, you know, obviously, that was the main tragedy, but um, we all thought, well, that's stuffed our book. And we, and we didn't do anything about it for three or four months. And then but we thought, well, this is still a good idea and, and life must go on. And I said, well, why don't we try Guinness again? Because, you know, they, 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 they still exist. And Norris said he really wanted to do it because, you know, he, he, he work was one of the things he was going to be throwing himself into. And um, we did it with Guinness and it was very, very successful. And it, we, we, we lost interest a bit by about the early 90s. And nowadays the charts, they exist, but they don't really mean as much or anything. Oh, like they don't. And, they and, don't. and they're very ephemeral and there's so many charts. And I sometimes hear about, you know, someone like Jess Glynn, who seems to me to be very talented, but she's had seven number ones. I mean, <laughs> that, that knocks Connie Francis into a cocked hat. But what it really means is that number ones are in a way, easier to get now. Yeah, yeah. Well, they are. You have to sell so few records. Well, you either that, have it. Yeah. It's either a number one or a flop, isn't it? You yeah, know, it's, yes. It's kind Come, of nothing yeah. in between. Yeah, it comes at number one. Next week, it's number 46. Because we um, were talking about this only the other day uh, when we were setting a quiz. And actually, I'll try Tim on this. 
He was the, 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 God, at the time, probably the first British act to have three records go in at number one. Go in at number one. Go in at number one. Probably Slade, was it? Hey, you're absolutely well correct. That's, uh, go, uh, well, that's very good. Because Mark and I were saying, well, surely the Beatles must have. But of course not. No, and they, I went and checked. I think they, I don't think any of the Beatles records went to the number one. I don't think, right? No, not necessarily no. at number one. And uh, and Frankie Goes to Hollywood was an album I think who had, might have had three records that went to Well, they, they went to no, number I don't think. No, no, actually, the first one didn't. It took a while. No, ago, Frank, Frankie didn't go straight to number one. No, no. Yeah. They, they, they had three consecutive number ones with their first three records. Yeah. yeah. Jerry and the Pacemakers had done before. Yeah, yeah. And the great ruse was always to release a single in, in early January, wasn't it? Because you could yeah. I remember in the eighties you could get a number one record with only something like seventeen thousand sales, whereas in December you needed something like three quarters yeah. of a million or whatever. But 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 in a way, um, having had number ones in February quite a lot, <laughs> in a <laughs> no disrespect. <laughs> no, well, in a way, I mean, yes, you're right. It's a great time to put a record out. Is the very very end of the year, just after Christmas, if it's a good record. But the competition's still there. I mean, you're, you're, you're still fighting for, you know, I mean, it, it's the same for everybody. And it, it's just that at Christmas, number nine will sell as many as a number one will in January or February. You're yeah. Right. But yeah. You've, it's still, I think it's just as hard to get up there. But yeah. um, except, I, I don't know, maybe you're right, because a lot of people don't think about, you know, they put their records and books all come out in October, I think. Barking mad. If I ever get around to doing volume two of my memoirs, I'm going to. Yeah, make sure surely. I'm come on. We. Come I was going to ask. Well, we you love the it. first. Yeah. Have you, have you started? Or February? Yes, I have started it because I've been doing this podcast, which, um, in fact, is building up into quite a few thousand words. Oh, this is get onto my cloud, get isn't it? Onto my cloud. I'm waiting That's for right. Mick and Keith to sue me for using their tune at the beginning, an instrumental version. It's not their version, it's um, my producer, Pete Hobbs, who's a very talented musician, has done a, a facsimile of the backing track of Get Off get off of My Cloud, and I call it Get Onto My Cloud. And I'm rather hoping Mick and Keith will sue me, because that'll be good publicity for the podcast. So I was listening to one the other day, and you were talking about how the Queen's Gambit could possibly help the sales of your, yes. your record, Chess, because chess, chess set sales are now uh, tenfold, aren't they? No, it, it's extraordinary. We, we, I mean, it's a jolly good series, I thought. I, I yeah. Really it. And um, we'd always said, I reckon we were ahead of our time. And in fact, Chess, the musical, is, is always being done somewhere. It's on in Moscow at the moment. Yeah. Like the only place where they're, they're putting big musicals on um, right now. Um, and it, it, it was always, I think, difficult to convince people that a story about chess could be entertaining. Yes. It's not really about yeah. chess. And really, we should have called it something like Queen's Gambit or something, because people then think, what's that about? Rather than, yeah. oh, it's about chess, I don't like chess. But the Queen's Gambit has now made people like chess. And with luck, it'll help. I mean, it should. We, are, we are talking about um, maybe getting a film together, which I think would be great fun before we all go to the great porn or night shop in the sky or whatever. <laughs> While we were talking about Christmas records, have you got a Christmas record? The only one I did really was Winter's Tale, which I, I did with Mike Batt, David Essex, which was right. a big hit, actually. Um, and only in England. It never... Never went anywhere else, I don't think. It was released in Australia in December, and of course, the middle of the summer, which didn't help. Yeah. So you haven't got one of those that returns every Christmas. Well, Winter's Tale gets played a lot. Um, I mean, a lot. You, I mean, I've heard it a couple of times this year so far. Um, and I did one with Andrew, uh, which Perry Como recorded, called Christmas Dream, which um, does get played a bit. Yeah, it was played on something the other day. Someone rang up and said, or one of my kids said, oh, Christmas Dream's on radio too. By the right. time I found the radio, it was, it was off. <laughs> <laughs> so what have you been doing with yourself the last eight months? You've been well, working been on doing, your memoirs? Um, I've been working on the memoirs in a way because I've been writing these podcasts, which has taken up a bit more time than I thought. I thought I'd do it for 10 weeks during this brief lockdown. But of course, it's, as everybody did not realise, it's gone on a lot longer, um, uh, unexpectedly in a way. And um, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff to do with um, other shows. I mean, we, we were working on a revival of Aida, which is a show that's never been to um, Britain. Uh, it, it was a big hit on Broadway for me and Elton. And there was a plan, um, which is still there, to bring it to England. And we were, or we were reworking it um, uh, with Disney. Just just got into meetings. We were and, and we were going to go over next week to. Uh, the, I mean, sorry, when I say next week, the 
first week of the lockdown. We, we were going to go over um, to continue reworking it with a workshop and, and, and potential cast. And of course, all that's been dropped. So um, I've been doing a little bit of work on AIDA, but you can't do too much until you actually get the actors and actresses there. And, 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 and the show, in a way, doesn't need too much work because it was, it was quite a big hit first time round. Yeah, um, yeah. And there have been lots of inquiries and things, and um, I, I've kept myself busy somehow. Right, right, right. So it, it's traditional on these on these uh, these uh, vodcasts, podcasts, whatever we, we uh, call them, that we ask people to tell us what is the greatest record ever made. And uh, Tim, I, I guess in your case, you've got loads of candidates that you could be choosing from. Well. Um, Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, in a way, my my favourite pop record of all time, my 45 from the old days, I always quote as my favourite because it was just an instant. The first time you heard it, you thought, number one. And that was Runaway by Del Shannon. I thought that was just... Oh, right. Record. Yes. And um, I actually did a cover version of it under the name Huddersfield's Transit Authority, um, which... Uh, <laughs> Nearly made it. It sold about five or six thousand, and Tony Blackburn played it, but it never quite got into the charts. Um, and Sorry, Huddersfield's Transit Authority. Yes, it was the time of Chicago. Is this the early oh. 1970s? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. And um, the plan was to do what Chicago did, was then to change our name to Huddersfield TA and then just to Huddersfield. But because we never had a hit, we, <laughs> that plan went out the window. <laughs> Why Huddersfield? I don't know. It just seemed to wonderfully inappropriate name yeah. um, it does it seems clunky in english doesn't it parochial well yeah. i had i've only been to huddersfield once and that was some years afterwards and um funny enough there was a program live from huddersfield last night tim brooke taylor's last um i'm sorry i haven't a clue it came from huddersfield um and so del shannon would be a candidate and, and for early singles um pre-beatles era I, I i would say summertime blues by eddie cochran is hard to beat mm. Lyrically, brilliantly um, up there. I mean, the lyrics of that song would would grace a top Broadway show, um, yeah. and great rhyming, very witty, an entire teenage rebellion in one minute fifty eight seconds. Now, who wrote the lyrics of that? Did well, he or was, Sharon? No, no, oh. Sharon Sheely wrote um, uh, "Poor Little Fool" for Ricky Nelson. Oh, okay. And, I thought, and, go on. And I think she wrote one or two of Cochrane's. I mean, she yeah. was engaged to Eddie Cochrane. But yeah. it was by Cochrane and Cape Hart. Right, and, I'm not, okay. and I'm not sure um, which who wrote the lyrics, but I think Eddie Cochrane had a big hand in them. 20 Flight Rock is a good lyric as well. I mean, the idea of a bloke... Uh, Running up the stairs. Yeah. Comes to, yeah, you, your girlfriend lives on the 20th floor, <laughs> and you know when you get up there, you're going to have a good time. But the lift's broken. <laughs> so the guy runs up the stairs. I want flight two, flight three, flight four. And by the time he, and he gets to the top, I'm too tired to I'm rock. too tired to rock. <laughs> and That's right, yeah. Your rock is a bit of a bit of a euphemism. A wonderful <laughs> lyric. And I mean, Eddie, Eddie Cochran, I thought, was a, and again, he was much bigger here than he was in America. Really? America, I was sitting next to somebody um, in America a few years ago, and she, she, she came from Oklahoma, which is where um, Eddie Cochran spent a lot of his um, early days. And I said, oh, and, and I was a statue of Eddie in Oklahoma. I think I'm, I'm not absolutely sure. And I said, oh, the great state that gave us Eddie Cochran. She said, who? And I thought, oh, good, good. you know, he just wasn't, wasn't known there. But yeah. I mean, the rockers know him. He was brilliant. Yeah. On yeah. everybody. Summertime blues. So 25 Rock, was that the one that George Harrison played as the audition piece uh, of the I Beatles? I think Paul McCartney allegedly played um, 20 Flight Rock. And John McCartney, Lennon, I think, played it to Lennon, didn't he? Yeah, it was very the fate. Paul, yeah. Paul knew all the words, yeah. um, yeah. which are you know, quite easy. If it were. It's one flight, two flight, three flight, four. <laughs> yeah. Right, but, right. But it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny song. I mean, just why Chuck Berry was so good, because every, every lyric, it was a wonderful story, you know, whether it was No Particular Place to Go or Maybelline or you know, Johnny B. Good. There was a great story. And, and I mean, there's the wonderful line in, in Johnny B. Good, you know, um, about the gunny sack. And I thought, you know, guitar and a gunny sack. And I thought, what's a gunny sack? And it, it is a sort of... It, it, it exists. Yeah. And, and um, I did a musical recently, which I've also been working on in my lockdown, uh, called From Here to Eternity, with a very talented young composer called Stuart Brayson. And it ran in the West End for six months, and it, it got quite good reviews, but it didn't, didn't quite make it. But we're gonna, we've had an offer to bring it back on tour. And there's a song in that called Ain't Where I Wanna Be Blues, which is really a tribute to Chuck Berry. And it has a line, um, 
mentioning a gunny sack. Um, I can't remember the lineup, so I've, I've got my troubles up, wrapped up in my gunny sack or something. But I thought I wanted for 50 years to get that word into a song, and at last I have, because yeah. the GIs in, in, in Hawaii in the 1940s tended to have gunny sacks lying around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I always think the tidiest ending to a song I know, although you probably know loads better, Tim, is the last verse of Chuck Berry's The Promised Land where he arrives in Los Angeles. Oh, yes. And it's yes. all, he, re, he repeats, he's calling Norfolk, Virginia, Tidewater, and then he reels off the number. Yes. Tell the folks back home, this is the promised land calling and the poor boy's on the line. It's just that yeah. he's it's gone better. all the way across the country. He's yeah. named all those places. He's named the method of transport between each of those places. Oh, yes. He's specified car, bus, plane, whatever. Yeah. And then when he arrives in Los Angeles, he phones back to say he's got that. Brilliant. How cool is that? It's brilliant. I mean, that, that, that's an in, I mean, it's a great lyric anyway, but the fact that he, he doesn't phone on the way, um, you know, <laughs> reminds us that the, and, and again, by the time I get to Phoenix, a great, great song by Jimmy Webb, um, you know, he can't call on his mobile because he doesn't have one. And uh, the song was written in 1967, I think. And um, it, it's, it, you think, well, it's a great, great song. It, you couldn't write it today. I mean, the song lives on because it's so good. But in, in today, you couldn't write a song, you know. No, 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 no. Well, no to, why aren't you ringing now? Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. That's, it's interesting. So many American songs are written about distance, aren't they? Yes. They're written about right. going from one place to the other. Yeah. yeah, which seems so magical if you were British. The idea that you yeah. had this tiny little uh, island that you were living on, that, that this was 3,000 miles. Of, uh, I know, even, even you know, writing a song about driving down to Cornwall doesn't really... It no. doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you doing for Christmas? Are you at home? I'm, I'm, I'm staying here and um, grandchildren will be coming around. I think that's legal. I'm, you know, right, yeah. Um, so we'll be in a, in a um, family social bubble. Right. Well, and, um, tip. It, it, it'll be fine. I mean, I'll be playing a few 78s. And I got, I bought a Christmas record, maybe the final one. Oh, go. go on. Oh, yeah, go on. This is a double EP, very oh, rare. Whoa. Frank Sinatra, and it's Christmas songs. It's lovely, actually. Christmas songs by Sinatra. And it's on Columbia, American. This is an American record. Right. It says underneath here, Unbreakable Record. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I them wrong. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. The world after '78. Yeah, but, but it's it's got eight tracks, so, so it's um it's like an album, really. I mean, and, and it's it's got um mainly Carol, Silent Night, and and um you know one, a little town of Bethlehem and things like that. Here comes Santa Claus. One, you know, it's, it's this this is good, and and of course maybe my favorite Christmas album, Phil Spector's is 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 good, but it's a bit all the same if you hear the whole thing. Frosty the Snowman's brilliant, of course. Um, but Elvis's Christmas album is hard to beat. I mean, such great songs and, um, you know, Blue Christmas and Santa Bring My Baby Back to Me. It's a wonderful album. Well, we'll all be getting it out on your recommendation. We'll be <laughs> streaming it, which won't be no. the same at all. No, it won't. <laughs> Tim, it's been lovely to talk lovely to you. Lovely to talk to you. It's brilliant. Well, thank, thank you very much, guys. Thank I'm, you. I'm honoured to be included in your whatever it is. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and have a good Christmas. Same to you. And I hope, hope, hope to see you both you, uh, in the flesh. I absolutely. So. That would yeah. be great. great. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.